Hi, I'm Hoyt Kesterson. I'm here to talk about this mock trial. It's structured in the following way. First, we'll lay our scene, laying out the hypothetical, describing everything that's going on, and then finally we'll transfer it over to our judge. After we transfer it to the judge, we'll actually have fact witness testimony. We have two fact witnesses and each and two lawyers, and each lawyer will, uh, will interview each fact witness. Then we're going to get down to legal argument. The two lawyers will basically argue their position. And then we'll have the decision and commentary by Judge Beeler. But prior to doing that, she's going to look for bold souls out in the audience who will actually opine on how they would have actually decided and why. So we'd like to have some audience participation here. The Who I Want to Grow Up to Be company decides that in, in, in November of 2019 that they would like to produce a set of action figures based on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's going to be four dolls, one when she's a young girl, one when she's a graduating law student, one when she's a practicing law attorney, and one when she's a Supreme Court judge. They're under some pressure to get this out in the following, following Christmas. So they're going to have to go out to all their suppliers. They have to go to put out for quotes. And they're concerned about two things. Seeing all the attacks and everything that's happening, they want to make certain that whoever they choose is resilient, can resist attacks. And also, they don't want anyone to steal their ideas, so they want to make sure that they're secure so that they'll be confidential. So in their RFP, they actually put out a requirement. If you come to us with a proposal, you have to state that you have commercially reasonable security. You have to have had a third-party security assessment. You've had to have had a third-party penetration test, and you must buy adequate cyber insurance. And so companies run around and start doing all this good stuff who want to bid for it. And, and the one that wins the bid for the production of the dolls, not the costumes, not everything else, but just the dolls themselves, is a company called Dolls R Us. They, they've done all this stuff they're supposed to do. The unfortunate problem is that Dolls of Us has already really been penetrated. So nefarious never-do-wells have already penetrated them. They've compromised credentials. They've taken over accounts. They've done all the persistent stuff that people talk about. They, they've uh, surveilled the environment. They've escalated privileges. One of the, and they've inserted code into various modules. And one of the clever things they've done is they've noted that there's an encryption utility that has a, a, a service that, they're, that they use which encrypts the, encrypts the uh, uh, backups. And so what they've done is they've gone in and taken over the role of the administrator and surreptitiously changed the backups uh, keys. So, so, hey, we're getting backups, but since the company doesn't seem to be testing their backups, they don't notice that they're not any good. But they end up compromising management, development, manufacturing systems, and they get pretty good control. And then over the Labor Day weekend, when everybody's off, they pull the trigger and they just encrypt, encrypt, encrypt and put everything away and lock everything away. And when people come back the day after Labor Day, they see this message. We would like a lot of money. Well, this causes a real problem. Basically, what happens is it takes six months, even, even paying the ransom. It takes six months before Dolls R Us can resume production because it just takes time to undo all this good stuff. And things get messed up. Six weeks. Dolls R Us obtains, uh, retains Alpha, Beta, and Gamma a law firm in anticipation of litigation. They, they know they're in trouble. That firm retains Technotronic for forensic investigation. Who I want to grow up to be misses the holiday season. And because they have, they have to pay other people who are supplying into this thing, they have to pay a lot of money for no product that they can deliver, so they sue. The law firm asserts that technotronic interviews of Dolls of Us staff and the report on investigative findings are privileged work product and not producible in discovery. Naturally, someone takes umbrage at that. So on May 17th in 2021, in the federal court for the U.S. District of the Cloud, we find ourselves with the following people. Presiding is United States Magistrate Judge Laurel Beeler. Kimberly Peretti is, is the, law for, is the uh, counsel for Dolls R Us, for the defendant. April Doss is the lawyer, the attorney, for 
who I want to be, the, uh, who I want to grow up to be, the plaintiff. Julie Lewis is the director of Technotronics Investigation. She's a fact witness, not an expert witness, and she's going to, and, and she's from the company that did the forensic investigation. And then there's me, your redoubtable Greek chorus, but I'm also playing the role of the vice president of information system of Dar, uh, Dolls R Us, and I'm a fact witness. And so I now I transfer to Judge Beeler. We're here today. Uh, in the case of uh, who I want to be when I grow up versus Dolls R Us, the parties dispute whether uh, uh, whether uh, who I want to be is entitled to the report that Dolls R Us uh, generated. Um, Ms. Doss, uh, you, it's your motion to compel. Let's hear from you first about why you think you ought to get the report, and then we'll hear from Ms. Peretti about why she thinks it's privileged. Thank you, Your Honor. Icon inspiration, trailblazer, one of a kind. Mm -hmm. These are the words that have been used to describe Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. These were the words that were being used to describe her throughout 2020, a time of extraordinary political um, conversation in this country and a time when Ruth Bader Ginsburg's example and legacy were more vital to the nation than ever. My client, who I want to be when I grow up, was looking to make that example of iconic inspiration available to children and adults all over the nation to carry on Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy and to inspire future generations. My client laid out terrific plans to do that, engaged in due diligence with Dolls R Us, demanded that they have cybersecurity precautions in place, and ensured that the contract specified that Dolls R Us had to be able to deliver on its part of the manufacturing process in time to get these, uh, these figures to the public in time for the holiday season. Solely due to the failures of Dolls R Us to properly and adequately secure its systems, its failure to implement reasonable security procedures, my client suffered staggering losses loss of opportunity in the inability to bring these dolls to market and financial losses, direct financial losses in my client's inability to make good on its commitments to its vendors and suppliers. With that in mind, we've come before this court asking for the information that we are presumptively entitled to, which is the information associated with the forensic investigation and interviews of Dolls R Us personnel that were tied to the incident investigation following the ransomware penetration. We know that Technotronics did work before the incident. We know Technotronics did work after the incident. We have reason to believe that failure to remediate the early issues led to, at least in part, the incident that caused my client's damages. And of course, as the court is aware, it is always the party claiming privilege that has the burden to establish privilege. We believe in this matter that Technotronics engagement was part of a routine business procedure and set of operations that Dolls R Us would have carried out in any event, and that it is not entitled to the shield of attorney client privilege or work product, which currently Dolls R Us is attempting to use to withhold that information. Good. Thank you, Ms. Doss. Uh, uh, Ms. Preddy, it's your, it is your burden to establish privilege. Uh, what, what, what's the basis for your contention that it's privileged? Well, yes, Your Honor, we are here today to address two protections fundamental to the practice of law. First, the protection of communications between an attorney and her client through attorney-client privilege. Second, the protection over work product that an attorney or its agents generate when anticipation of litigate in litigation. While these protections are generally well established, we are here today to settle whether the protections should fall, where the protections should fall based on the facts of this case. And what are the facts? Dolls R Us has been contracted by plaintiff to manufacture a series of Ruth Bader Ginsburg action figures. As part of the contracting process with the plaintiff, Dolls R Us agreed to perform a third party security assessment and pen testing of its information systems. These assessments and pen testing were completed last June. Then in September, Dolls R Us suffered a ransomware attack. This attack crippled its operation for at least six weeks, which resulted in production delays for its products and services, products, and specifically to the new line of the Ruth Gator Binsberg ac action figures. As you will hear today through testimony from the Director of Technotronic Investigations and the Dolls R Us Vice President of Information Systems, 
Dalzeros immediately engaged outside counsels to investigate the matter and manage the legal risk associated with the attack. Legal counsel then engaged an external cybersecurity forensics firm, Technotronic, to investigate and remediate the attack and all the communications and work product relating to that investigation were directed and controlled by Dalzeros in-house and outside legal counsel. It is Dalzeros' position that the communications and information regarding the ransomware investigation with Technotronic, including the forensic report, are protected under the attorney-client privilege and the work product doctrine. But we must also be precise in drawing the line around what constitutes protected information here. The court should distinguish between the general cybersecurity assessment and pen penetration testing performed in June and the materials gener generated as part of the privileged ransomware investigation. Dalzeros is not claiming general the general cybersecurity assessment and penetration testing performed in June are protected by the attorney-client privilege or the work product doctrine. This work was not done at the direction of counsel or in, in anticipation of litigation, but rather to support the business and contracting needs of the company. In contrast, the ransomware investigation was conducted and led by count, outside counsel, and its primary purpose was to provide legal advice to Dolls R Us in anticipation of litigation. Unlike the general business purpose of the June incident, the ransomware investigation involved, involved a whole host of legal issues. Those legal issues are, for exa example, whether there was data exfiltration or other unauthorized access to systems that would trigger state data breach notification statutes, whether the incident was material to the organization of Dolls R Us and could trigger SEC disclosures or other con contractual reporting obligations, whether engaging with and communicating with and paying threat actors could violate OFAC sanction or international sanctions against providing support to terrorists, and whether there's an increased risk of legal claims or litigation arising out of the in incident and what those defenses, what defenses might be available to Dolls R Us. So, of course, Dolls R Us bears the burden of establishing that the asserted privileges and protections apply. To satisfy that burden, Dolls R Us will begin testimony from two individuals, Julie Lewis, the director of Technotronic Investigations, and Hoyt L. Kesterson II, uh, the vice president of in information systems this, uh, of Dolls R Us. And this testimony will confirm that the ransomware investigation was for a legal purpose and different in scope from the general business purpose of the cybersecurity work that the company had previously done. And lastly, we will close with legal arguments showing how these facts satisfy the various standards for attorney-client privilege and work product protection. All right. Thank you very much to you both for those opening remarks. Uh, and I, the witnesses previously have been sworn uh, in the interest of efficiency. And so, um, Ms. Preddy, I understand you're going to call your first witness, Ms. Lewis from Tektronic. Ms. Lewis. Ms. Lewis, Lewis, can you please state your name for the record? Absolutely. Julie Lewis. And what is your occupation? Sure, I'm director um, of Technotronic Investigations. Okay. And, and can you describe what Technotronics is? Absolutely, uh, Technotronic is a provider of security assessments, pen testing, as well as incident response and cyber investigation services. And what is a vendor security assessment? Sure, a vendor security assessment is looking at the controls within a, a organization uh, to see where there may be weaknesses and recommending um, changes that need to occur based on uh, a vendor uh, requirement for due diligence uh, and looking at their security controls. And how do these security assessments occur? Um, so generally, these security assessments could be brought uh, based on internal needs where they just want a, a company just wants to strengthen their security controls or it could be brought on by an external vendor requirement um, where uh, a corporation is looking to use our client for services. Okay. And what is penetration testing? So a penetration test is essentially hiring a third party like Technotronics to try to access or penetrate systems or applications that you believe are secure. 
Uh, it is like trying to simulate the way a threat actor or hacker would try to access systems illegally. Um, it's also known as red team uh, testing in the, in the security world. And what is incident response or a cyber investigation? What type of services are those? Yeah, a, a cyber investigation is generally when there's um, some known wrongdoing. For example, a hacker or inter insider got into systems and um, trying to figure out the who, what, when, and how of what happened, um, trying to stop um, any kind of data incident, as well as looking for PII and PHI, which may have been affected for breach notifications. And what is a forensic investigation, or is that the same thing as incident response of a cyber investigation? Um, it's, it's really the same thing um, where we're conducting an analysis um, and providing information on what happened uh, into, uh, and generally into a report if requested by counsel. And, and how does Technotronic staff engagements for security assessments, penetration tests, and incident response? How, how, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. How, how does Technotronic staff engagements related to security assessments, penetrations, and incident response? Sure, absolutely. Um, so there, we have different personnel based on security assessments, uh, penetration testing, and then we have a Chinese wall, basically a segregation um, of our incident response and cyber investigations practice. So there's absolutely different skill sets uh, on both sides. And for the two engagements with Dals R Us, were the same teams used for the security assessment and penetration testing as the incident response? Um, no, they were separate teams that were used with, with different skill sets for each one of those services. Okay, and was there any individuals that uh, participated in both efforts? Um, the only overlap would be myself um, in doing the agreements, but not on the actual uh, underlying work or quality control. And then Ms. Lewis, without revealing any privilege information, what services as any has Technotronic provided to Dolls or Us? Sure, we were engaged back in June um, to perform security assessment and pen testing. Um, and then uh, after we provided the results of that, um, we uh, were engaged by external counsel in September uh, to conduct a cyber forensics, or you know, you may call it um, incident response and cyber investigations. And are you familiar with the agreements Technotronic signed to provide these services? Uh, ab absolutely. The, the first agreement was with Technotronic directly. Um, we uh, performed that at, uh, we were brought in by Hoyt Kesterson uh, who is the VP of Information Systems. The, uh, the second part that we performed again with segregation and a Chinese wall um, was to perform our cyber forensics work or incident response. And that was at the uh, external counsel, uh, Alpha Beta Gamma was directly reached out to us for that um, with work directed by, by the law firm. So who signed both of these engagements? Who signed the, the security assessment agreement? Yeah, the first agreement, the security assessment and pen testing was signed by Mr. Kesterson, uh, again, who's the vice president of information systems. The second agreement for cyber forensics work was signed by external counsel Alpha Beta Gamma. And was the scope of services for each agreement the same or very different? Um, the scope was completely different uh, on both and different uh, staffing was used on, on both matters. And can you give us a, a sense quickly of what the scope of services was for each of them? Um, sure, so the, the, the first scope was, um, the, again, that was with directly with Technotronic. Uh, was performing security assessment for, for a vendor um, need uh, that was required in due diligence and then penetration testing. Um, so that would be, you know, performing, looking for uh, potential holes that a hacker or external party uh, might 
um, perform against their what they consider their secure uh, environment. Um, the second is the cyber forensics, and that again was with Alpha Beta Gamma, um, and that was um, looking at what had happened looking at how to get them back up and running uh, when they were hit with ransomware, and then um, performing analysis in a report, uh, and then subsequently looking at any PII or PHI that might have been affected. I just want to remind you, um, uh, Ms. Preddy, of the time. Okay, I just had one, um, you know, one, two last short questions. Was there a forensic report prepared for the engagement with Dolls R Us? Um, yes, there was, and that was uh, provided directly to external counsel. And who directed um, Technotronics to produce that report? Uh, that was Alpha, Beta, Gamma, the law firm, okay. external counsel. Thank, thank you very much. I have no further questions. All right. Ms. Doss, your witness. Ms. Lewis, thank you for being here today. Um, how long has Technotronics been in the business of doing security assessments? Um, we've been doing this for over, over 10 years. And how long have you been in the business of doing incident response or forensics uh, reports? Sure, we've been doing uh, cyber forensics or, or com and computer forensics for over 18 years. Um, are you familiar from that experience with the fact that some, in some instances, um, incident response vendors work is covered by insurance? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and that sometimes um, insurers that underwrite cyber insurance coverage, in fact, have lists or panels of preferred vendors that they approve for um, use under uh, covered acts. Is that right? Th that's correct. Um, Tektronics wasn't on the preferred list for the cyber insurance company um, that provided coverage for Dolls R Us, was it? No, it was not at the time. So you were not part of any of the panel coverage that would ordinarily be retained for an incident involving Dolls R Us, is that correct? That is correct. So, how, so in fact, there was a specific request to add Tektronix to the list of authorized providers for Dolls R Us cyber insurance, isn't that correct? Uh, that's correct because we we're involved in the security assessment and pen testing. So we already knew the environment so we could react quick, more quickly. And was and that request was made by Dolls R Us, was it not? That's correct. So that they could use us uh, and we'd be covered by the insurance carrier. And at that point, did the insurance carrier then ask Tektronix to provide some background information about your capabilities and so forth so they could determine whether to approve you? That's correct. And this happened before the cyber incident that's at issue here. Is that correct? Um, it happened after the cyber in, in, in conjunction. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, the security assessment team um, found uh, so a number of deficiencies, as is ordinarily the case, some things that can be remediated. Is that correct? That, that's correct. In the course of doing the forensic investigation, isn't it the case that um, part of the investigation was focused on determining whether any of the deficiencies found in the security assessment played a role in the penetration in this incident? That's correct. Our cyber forensics team had to talk to our pen testing and security assessment teams. So the forensics team had access then to the report from the security assessment team, correct? They, they, my understanding is they asked for it and they, they reviewed that report as part of the, the cyber forensics portion and reporting. So there was some discussion then between the forensics team and the team that had previously done the security assessment. Is that correct? That's correct. Similar to if it was external company, um, that would be a common process in the, the debriefing to do the analysis. Okay. Um, so where you indicated early that the only overlap was yourself in signing the agreements. In fact, there was conversation between those two different teams as the forensic team was going through its work to make sure that it understood the environment it was looking at based on the previous work. 
That's correct. Um, there were different technical resources, however, um, but that communication happened between teams. And um, just a couple of other questions. Um, I, I know you indicated that you've been doing forensics work uh, at Technotronics for many years. And, and I would imagine that in some instances you do that um, by direct engagement with a client or customer and uh, in other cases by direct engagement from a, a law firm. Is that generally correct? It, it depends on what it is, but in the, the cyber incidents involving data potential data breaches, it's, it's driven by counsel in general. And um, have you ever been engaged by the law firm Alpha, Beta and Gamma before? No, this is the first time. Thanks very much, nothing further. Thank All right, you. the witness may be excused. And are you ready to call your next witness, Ms. Preddy, Mr. Kesterson? Yes. All right, yeah. so you may proceed. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Kesterson. Please introduce yourself and, and to the court, say your name and title. Uh, my name is uh, Hoyt Dell Kesterson II. I'm the Vice President in Charge of Information Technology for Dahl's Arrest. And how long have you been a vi Vice President for Information Systems? Five years. Can you briefly describe your role? Uh, my role is pretty much everything that happens with computers. That's the normal business processing, the process of uh, keeping it running. I don't have operations, but I do have the, all the stuff that runs on it. And of course, naturally, all the stuff that secures the environment. And what types of policies does Dolls R Us have in place for its information technology program? Well, we actually have quite a thorough set of uh, policies, uh, which we thought for written information security policies, which here we fondly refer to as WISP. Uh, we have uh, uh, remote access policies, we have use policies, we have uh, uh, business continuity and disaster recovery policies, and we have incident response policies. And are you familiar with the incident response policy? Yes, I am. Under this in, uh, in incident response plan, who is responsible for managing and conducting incident response? Well, it depends on the incident response itself. Uh, we have concerns if in fact it ever affects user data and so forth, because then we know there's a potential all kinds of statutory, regulatory, and all kinds of people coming after us. So in that particular case, we, we, we handed over to the lead over to, the, to a law firm, but other kinds of stuff, just normal incidences, we st structure a team out of our own internal resources. And are you familiar with the vendor security assessments? Are you familiar with vendor security assessments and penetration testing? Uh, yes, I am. Has Dolls R Us ever been asked to perform a security assessment or penetration test? Yes, in, in a recent, to satisfy a recent RFP for uh, who I want to grow up to be, we had to have uh, a security assessment. We had to have uh, penetration testing and uh, we, get, we did so. And, and who performed the security assessment and penetration testing? We engaged tech, Technotronics. What was the scope of your engagement with Technotronic at that time? The scope is the, the, the standard stuff, basically to, to, to do penetration tests, to see our firewalls are configured properly, to examine uh, all our configurations, to look at our policies, to make sure we have in place uh, reasonably, reasonable commercial security. And what line in the Dolls R Us annual budget, budget would have paid for these services? Well, this would come out of our IT budget. Okay. What were the results of the security um, assessment and penetration testing generally? Well, they weren't perfect. So we spent the summer getting our act together so that we could respond to the RFP that we had a good, that we, that we had what needed to be in place. Did you provide the results to who I want to be when I grow up? Uh, no, we just basically said we satisfy the requirements. Has Dolls R Us ever had to use its incident response policy? Absolutely, most recently. And when Council, was that? I just am gonna remind you of the time issues. I know that you have a number of questions you need to ask here, but I think we all understand that there was a ransomware attack here and it took six weeks for the company to recover. So I suggest you get right to the scope of the work so because you're already over time. Okay. Um, and we, all, we also know that outside counsel, you know, we've had the outside counsel testimony. So why don't we try to, uh, get to the get to the quick. Okay, can you just, uh, tell us the type of agreement that you engaged with Technotronic to uh, conduct the um, uh, incident response, please? Uh, that was essentially uh, done by our, our council because of the, they needed. They basically stated 
They needed to know the scope of the, the attack so that they can properly uh, advise us on uh, exposure. And how did you pay for the incident response in these services? Uh, in this particular case, it was paid for out of our legal contingency budget. And what controls did outside counsel place around the sharing of information from the investigation? Uh, very much need to know. We had to actually split into different teams, teams to actually correct it, who correct all the problems, which knew they were addressing a ransomware attack. And then another team, which is basically trying to put controls in place to make sure it didn't repeat. Those people didn't know why they were doing what they were doing. And they were just following the instructions and they were following the instructions led by a very limited number of people who had access to the, uh, to the incident response to, pardon me, to the forensic examination report. To, so to, to be clear, did you involve IT staff or other members in the investigation? Were they aware of the report? Did they read the report? Only, only uh, three people, myself, my assistant, uh, assistant director, and one other person, the architect, so that we could structure a plan to, 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 to advise the second team. What other controls did you have in place to keep the investigation confidential? Well, they were told not to talk about it. That's, you can't do much more than that. Okay. Um, then to, to your knowledge, did the investigation team abide by those rules? To my knowledge, they did. No All further right, questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pretty. Ms. Doss, your witness. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kesterson, um, the Dazaras incident response plan that you referred to, uh, that specifically calls for um, conducting an investigation whenever there's a significant incident. And as you described, for certain types of incidents, Council may be engaged, and for other types of incidents, the uh, investigation will be done in-house. I believe that's what you testified to, correct? That's correct. So in any case, under your incident response plan, isn't it true that the IRP, or incident response plan, calls for determining to the extent possible what root causes might be of the incident? Yes. And does it also call for determining to the extent possible what the scope of the incident is? Uh, yes. And does it call for, to the extent reasonable, advising on remediation steps that may be beneficial? That's certainly responsibility, yes. And doesn't the IRP also call for an investigation report to be done for all significant incidents? Yes, at the end of the incident, you're supposed to basically, what did we learn? And that after action report gets prepared regardless of the type of incident, does it not? Yes. And it gets, and that after action report gets prepared regardless of whether the incident is conducted by outside counsel or in-house, is that correct? Well, that one that one slightly depends. Uh, we don't really address any, any 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 legalities. Okay, that's not our business, right? So we don't write it for that. We basically say this is the stuff we fixed, and why. Okay. So then, in order to be more clear, is it the case that under the IRP, the technical dimensions of the forensic report, the assessment to the extent possible of root cause, scope, and any remediation actions that may be relevant are done regardless of the type of incident? Yes, the, we, we, we record everything in terms of, of change control documentation and so forth as to what we did. Dollaros has had a relationship with Technotronics for some time, is that correct? I wouldn't necessarily say for some time. We, 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 we've known them off and on, we knew about them and that's why we, we typically don't have a requirement from a vendor to do for, from a, a pardon me from a from a customer to say you have to do an assessment report. So, but we knew them. So when we had to do it, uh, based on short notice, they're the people we went to. Sure, and and you were happy with their work on the security assessment, I assume. Well, we got the contract. And uh, so. As a result of the work they had done on the security assessment, didn't you also consider whether or not they might be a good choice to do incident response work for Dolls R Us if it was ever needed? Well, of course, naturally you think of that, you know, because there's someone whom you worked with and the advantage is they've just studied your system, so they kind of know how it works. And 
isn't it the case that it was in fact Dolls R Us that reached out to your cyber insurer, insurer to inquire whether Tektronix could be approved as an incident response vendor in the event that incident response would be needed? Well, we wanted to make certain with our insurer what could be done. And since we knew these people, we asked our insurer if in fact they did do it, would we, would we get covered? And they, they said, yes, if we do certain things. So. so you reached out to the insurer and asked, could Tektronix be a preferred or panel or approved provider for the forensics, correct? Yes. And you reached out to Julie Lewis and said, we'd like to have Technotronix be one of our providers. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you talked about uh, the budget that was used to pay for the forensics response work um, and the security assessment work. And you indicated that the security assessment work had already been paid out of the cyber budget. I want to talk about the budget for a minute. Within the Dolls RS organizational structure, the cyber organization and the legal department both report to the same person, the VP of finance, is that correct? Yes. So both budget lines are within that same organizational component, correct? Well, it's all one big bucket, yes. And you mentioned earlier that Dolls R Us had not anticipated having to do the security assessment this year. That was something that was prompted by a request from my client. Is that correct? That's correct. So Dolls R Us on the cyber budget had already incurred unanticipated costs for this year, correct? Uh, yeah, I would say so, but we really hoped the contract would make up for that. Sure, but but there were some additional expenses that had not been anticipated at the well, beginning yes. of the budget cycle. Right. We, we, we don't normally have to do, we're, we're not under anything where we have to do, we're a manufacturer. We don't really kind of do security assessments like financial firms and so forth. So when the question came up of who was going to pay from Dolls R Us for the, the bill, if you will, for the forensic report, there was a conversation, wasn't there, among the VP of finance and you about whether that should come from the cyber department or the legal budget, wasn't there? Well, there was discussion about who should handle this, right? Certainly, we, we had all kinds of concerns. I mean, our basic plan said, you know, if, it was, if it's data loss, but Ransomware isn't necessarily data loss, but we also knew that there was going to be litigation because we couldn't meet a contract. So what do we do? So we kind of, a bit of a tizzy, and we said, okay, this should really go into legal. And that's why it came out of legal funding. And that's why it was handed over to Alphabet and Gamma to Lee. And weren't you also concerned that your numbers were already over budget and you knew that having the forensic response come out of the cyber budget would put you even further in the red? Well, I was certainly concerned with my numbers, but I was much more concerned with the fact that I just had the company shut down six weeks with my thing. So when you look at the problem, yes, it was a problem, but not as big as a problem of the fact that we, we lost six weeks. Ms. Doss, I'll remind you of your time. Yep, just one further question. So um, isn't it the case that some of the deficiencies that were found in the security assessment were relevant in the penetration that resulted in this ran ransomware attack? Uh, yes, we didn't catch everything. That's true. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, if someone gets into your system, it's clearly your fault. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. All right. Thanks to the witnesses who are excused. Counsel, you each have about three minutes uh, to, uh, for, to make closing remarks. Let's begin. I think because it's, uh, I, I think we'll begin with Ms. Preddy since it's her burden. Sure, Your Honor, the communications related to and materials generated from the ransomware investigation, including the forensics report, should be protected from disclosure for the following reasons. First, they are protected because of the attorney-client privilege. Um, you know, as we see from cases that touchstone for the attorney-client privilege is whether there's a confidential communication and that communication was made for the purpose of rendering legal advice. Here, we have the fact witnesses say the communications were confidential and that the materials were pro provided for the, the primary purpose of rendering legal advice for Dolls or Us, including whether state data breach notification statutes may have been implicated, whether paying the criminals uh, may have been prohibited by OFAC regulations, whether the, the, the event was material, whether um, contracts could have been breached causing litigation. Counsel must be involved in leading and directing the investigation at every, at every juncture in order to assess these risks. I, but can you tell me why the lawyers had to have the technical analysis to provide the legal advice? 
Was right, it really necessary? Because, you know, pursuant to Covell, they need third party agents to help translate and understand the technical facts, which implicate the legal risk. So those technical facts help us understand what deficiencies occurred, what reasonable security was in place, whether certain systems were accessed um, and may have had data compromised on them. So they helped us in rendering legal advice to the organization. Did Dolls R Us have any other source of information to, uh, to allow it to take remedial action besides this forensic investigation? No, this, well, this forensic investigation allowed it to understand how the criminals got in. So um, it was very important for, for us to both render legal advice with respect to the um, incident, as well as, um, you know, there can be dual purposes to, um, to investigations. There's always going to be some fallout related to how to do certain remediation, but they were very, very careful to not share that exactly, you know, with the technical team that needed to do some of the corrective actions. But okay. the primary purpose here was to help instruct lawyers in rendering legal advice. Okay, so 15 seconds to wrap up and then we'll hear from Ms. Doss. Okay, so I also wanted to emphasize that there was a tightly, hold, um, tightly held information on the report. Um, it came from legal, the legal budget. It was a legal purpose to both for both the privilege purposes as well as the attorney client and work product privilege. Um, the, and importantly, that the investigator here was engaged in a very different scope of services in its prior relationship. It, there was no existing retainer to do incident response with this particular group. It was the first time they were engaged to do incident, respo incident response and it was by counsel. Okay, good, thank you very much, Ms. Doss. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first, I would draw the court's attention to the legal standard here, as was made clear by uh, this court in previous rulings. Um, Courts generally disfavor assertions of evidentiary privileges that could result, excuse me. <clears throat> Courts generally disfavor assertions of evidentiary privileges because they shield evidence from the truth-seeking process. As such, those privileges are to be narrowly and strictly construed, so they are confined to the narrowest possible limits consistent with the logic of its principle. We've seen courts up, uphold that principle time and again. We saw it most recently in the Capital One decision. And um, what Counsel for Dolls R Us is asking us to do is to fly in the face of that standard. In this instance, there was a pre-existing relationship between Technotronics and Dolls R Us. Technotronics had done work, gotten to know the system, created a security assessment, which revealed issues that were left unremediated and led to this ransomware that caused injury to my client. Um, because of that existing relationship, Mr. Kesterson said to Technotronics, we're gonna recommend you to counsel. Counsel brought in Technotronics. Mr. Kesterson went to the insurance company and said, we want them on our panel. It is clear that it was the company, Dolls R Us, that valued this relationship. There's nothing wrong with valuing that relationship, but there is a, a stream of work here. We can't view the, the forensic work in isolation. Even if we could view the forensic work in isolation, it's clear that Technotronics didn't. We have testimony from Julie Lewis at Technotronics that in fact, the two teams collaborated. They talked with each other to understand what they were looking for, what they were looking at. We have testimony from Mr. Kesterson indicating that under Dolls R Us's own IRP, the forensic report would have been done in any event. Counsel for Dolls R Us is pointing to the legal work that of course counsel has to do. Yes, of course counsel has to advise on any potential regulatory obligations and so forth. None of that is contained in the forensic report. That's contained in counsel's own work and counsel's own advice to the client. The forensic report was written by Technotronics. We believe it contains information that draws that straight line from the security assessment to the breach, to the, the scope and extent of the compromise that has injured our client. We can't see that information if it is shielded behind a privilege. We know from Mr. Kesterson that, you know, frankly, who paid out of which budget at Dolls R Us was a little bit of a fiction. He was over budget, it all comes out of the same pot. And as he said, you know what, if Dolls R Us has a breach, if they don't secure their systems, it's their fault. Once again, Counsel for Dolls R Us has an extraordinarily high burden. Counsel for Dolls R Us must demonstrate that not only did Dolls R Us know that this could result in litigation, 
but also that the work product would not have been prepared in substantially similar form, but for the pro but for the prospect of that litigation. Let me, let me ask you one question because you're about out of time. So maybe you could take 15 seconds to answer this. Under sure. what set of circumstances uh, in a uh, post breach analysis of the, the um, weaknesses that led to the breach, would a forensic report be work product under your theory of the law? Well, potentially, if it had been two different firms, if the two firms hadn't collaborated with each other, hadn't conversed with each other, hadn't consulted with each other. But in this instance, we know it's the, the company that did the security assessment provided some recommendations that apparently weren't all followed. There was a breach that resulted. The same company had two teams that consulted with each other to do the forensics report. And, and, and that's what we're, we're fighting over here. So okay. there's many scenarios where those facts would not converge. All right, does uh, anybody, so we, we had some, we had a lot of um, uh, heated discussion from the lawyers uh, and we were trying to keep things on a tight path to, um, to, to uh, get through the testimony. I think you guys did a great job illuminating the facts with the witnesses. Um, uh, uh, April or Kim, is there something that you would have liked to say from a legal perspective of why the case law supports your position that you didn't get a chance to say because you were cut off in the last uh, minute or so, a couple, a couple minutes of your closing remarks? Yeah, I would. I mean, there's um, there's been several cases now, Primera, Dominion Dental, Cap One, and the courts really are focused on that uh, statement of work, um, you know, and whether there was a previous similar engagement with the forensic firm, because um, a lot of times these forensic firms get hired, get hired by companies on, you know, repeatedly, and sometimes just by the company and then sometimes by outside counsel. So when the courts have seen the same scope of services happen earlier in an engagement for incident response and then a subsequent one where they're hired by counsel, often that, that, that's very determinative for them um, in their conclusion that the subsequent engagement has the same scope of services. So it's also, um, you know, it, it's also not... It's business. It's a business investigation rather than a you know for a legal purpose or in in anticipation of litigation. All right. So Kim, that was that was helpful. Um, April, anything that you wanted to add to that, or that you did that uh, you wanted to say, and you didn't have a chance to say. Yeah, nothing in particular I would have added in the scope of the argument the, itself, but I would just you know to add to some of um, of, of opposing counsel's comments on the, the landscape of the law. You know, one of the things that's a challenge here is that. Um, it's so common for uh, a forensic vendor to be on a retainer in advance of an incident happening. And, you know, in the face of good policy reasons for encouraging that to be done, the traditional work product analysis is a bit of a challenge. And if it were not so difficult to um, get around attorney client privilege issues in, in a line of questioning about exactly how much counsel really directed that forensic report, um, that would certainly be an area that as counsel for, for the plaintiff, I would have wanted to pursue because candidly and in, in many incident response, there can be wide variation in how much counsel truly directs the investigation that's done by the forensics firm and how much counsel you know, it works with them, is, is keeping an eye on the legal ramifications, but certainly not directing the technical work in many instances. Right. But that's a hard line of question to go down. Right. That's, it's, that's, a, uh, it's great observation. Um, uh, do you, th and do you think it's better practice and what's the, you know, the, if you think of it as, I, this is a shorthand, but if you think of it as, you know, fact product as opposed to work product uh, and any forensic report probably has at least some component of, you know, work product, opinion work product, directed work product, and there's probably going to be part of it. Is there really an upside for, uh, be for to have two reports because what does it matter anyway at the end if you get a reasonable forensic investigation that you need to make sure you do your remediation for a business purpose that you would have to do anyway? Um, what's the strategy here? Do you have um, any comments on that from the lawyers? Is it that's, that's the business question. Or it's a business slash litigation question. Do you have an idea? Do you have a, do you have a view of what you think is the best, better practice? 
you know, I, no, I just, I think it's challenging because, um, because either really way, do. you're producing information. You're probably not going to hide the fact information by having it directed by an attorney. You're just not, right? So uh, right. I think that's the answer. Yeah. Good. Well, with that, um, any concluding observations from our, you know, one last chance for someone for the audience. We have about a minute left. And I don't... Um, Let's see, we have somebody who just raised, just said something, sorry. Uh, so in the panel in the morning, the speaker suggested having a two-tech approach, content, yeah, conducting a, an investigation for business purposes and one for forensic purposes. That was really, that, that was the question or the observation. And, and that was what I was asking, is, is there really a strategic upside for doing that? Uh, because at the end of the day, the business, it's interesting, you would, you would certainly, you might have a better shot at insulating the report prepared for litigation purposes, maybe. The two, the two track report, but what, what, do you, what do you really gain by it? I think that's what I was trying to say rather inexpertly because you have to do the forensic investigation to remediate and to mitigate and to therefore reduce risk. And that has both a business purpose and a litigation purpose. So my question was, you know, does it really matter at the end? You're gonna have to give up the information that's fact information uh, and, and, uh, and investigations. And we all know this, there's a good way and a bad way to do investigations, but investigations that are done right are spendy. So uh, that's, a, that's another issue. So with that, I'm gonna look at our time and I think we're at time unless someone wants to correct me. So thank you everybody for your attention today. It was nice to see everybody. Oh, look, that's my alarm. <laughs> Hoyt, do you have the uh, last word to you? <laughs> nope, I think we're all good. All right. It's thank tough to do something like this in a short amount of time, but everyone did wonderfully. <laughs> you just speeded your voice up, that was cute. All right, thank you guys.